Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Perez uh, and welcome him to uh, today's seminar. Uh, Dr. Perez is uh, well known to most of us in the neurology department here at Mass General and beyond. Uh, he is uh, really a pioneer in integrating the approaches of psychiatry and neurology to manifestations of brain function and dysfunction. Um, he got his start at Columbia University uh, where he graduated cum laude and then uh, graduated Alpha Omega Alpha from NYU Medical School before uh, coming to Boston where he completed both a neurology residency in our program and a psychiatry residency in the uh, BIDMC program uh, before launching his career uh, in cognitive and behavioral neurology, uh, rising now uh, to becoming chief of the uh, Division of Behavioral Neurology and Integrated Brain Medicine division here at Mass General. Um, he is associate professor of both neurology and psychiatry at Harvard Medical School uh, and has become a real pioneer in the both the investigation and the treatment of functional uh, neurological disorders, which he will uh help us to understand better today. Uh, but uh, just on a personal level, it's been really a thrill to be a colleague of David's ever since uh, he came here as a resident. And uh, I imagine that this presentation will just continue my experience of learning uh, from your creative approach, your very empathic approach, and your very rigorous scientific approach uh, to these conditions and to these patients. So. Welcome, David. Jonathan, thank you very much. That was um, a really warm um, uh, introduction. I'm really grateful uh, to you. And it's just wonderful to be here with everyone. Um, let me just start a bit informally to say that um, my hope here is um, through this talk to be a bit conversation, to share all with you all, what is this entity of functional neurological disorder? One that really challenges how we think about neurologic disease, psychiatric disease, psychological abnormalities. And yet I also wanna posit that this is a condition that really challenges how we think about physical health versus mental health. Maybe we're just talking about health in general. And as we think about health, clearly this is such a core intersection for our um, collective interest in brain health and the spectrum of brain medicine meeting um, brain health and all of its point of intersections. So it's an ambitious challenge, but um, I'm gonna do my best. These are my disclosures. And I wanna take us a bit back to the future so that we can then think about where we're going next. Some of you may recognize the name Stanley Cobb. Stanley Cobb was a neurologist who established the first department of psychiatry here at the Massachusetts General Hospital. So a quote, there is no problem of mind versus body because biologically no such dichotomy can be made. The dichotomy is an artifact. There is no truth to it. And the discussion has no place in science in 1943. Think a really staggering quote. We have a long way to go in 2024 to realize this vision, but this is part of what I find very energizing in working with this population and then grappling a great range of questions that are in part catalyzed by working with patients with functional neurological disorder. Let's bring the patient um, at the forefront here of this conversation. This is somebody who has been generous, who has participated in our clinical multidisciplinary program, who's participated in our uh, R01 funded research program, and who more recently has allowed me to um, share her story with these video clips. I shared this story in Verona, Italy as part of a brief uh, case presentation. And, and I wanna share that with all of you here. Uh, this individual on these clips um, occurred in the context of a research visit just a couple of weeks ago. And so the first clip is describing how the patient is um, feeling on arrival for a research visit. 
Describe for me, yes. what are you experiencing right now? I think I'm emotional because uh, my speech is off and my face is very hardly to see. Now, it was um, a rainy day in the city of Boston about a month ago when uh, this video clip was recorded. And here's the patient putting her symptoms in context for us. And the, doc, and the guy says, did this happen before? He says, I don't have the name, like, like I'm like lying. Anyway, before that happened, I had another incident. I went into the wrong door and the door was open on the side. And the security said to me, how did you get in here? Like, like I'm a, like a criminal or something. I said, well, the door was open and I came in. I had to get out of the wet because it was so pouring out. And I think that could have escalated the FNG episode because it stressed me out. And he says, oh no, go down this way. And it's okay because he's, I think he saw maybe that I was up to end. Two minutes later, putting the longitudinal journey into context. Now. I think I'm a professional. <laughs> I understand how it ticks. I wish I could get rid of it. That would be the greatest thing, but it's something I have to live with. So I have to have my tools to make this not so severe and come out of it faster. Before, I couldn't come out of it faster because I really didn't know what to do. And the first thing people say, oh, don't talk, don't talk, because it's going to get you more excitable and more nervous and do it. Actually, that's the total opposite. Talking helps to tell people and to understand what FND is. And then the face starts to come back up and the face starts to relax. And this is not a treatment um, related talk, but just for context, this is somebody who's participated deeply in our embedded psychotherapy program within neurology and has also participated with our occupational therapists and um, physical therapists for a variety of her symptoms. Functional neurological disorder, I'm gonna use the abbreviation F and D, okay? And um, the epidemiology studies now suggest that this is likely among the top five reasons to see an outpatient neurologist, okay? So a major public health problem. We have increasing data around healthcare expenditures. Chris Steven, a neurologist here at Mass General, um, really put this on the map in a nice way in JAMA Neurology a couple of years ago where he looked at a large, um, uh, several large databases and uh, uh, was able to report estimates of $1.2 billion spent in the emergency department and inpatient hospital care for patients with F&D in the US annually. These costs are only on the rise and really rival many other major uh, neurologic conditions that we care for. Um, the treatment paradigm and diagnostic paradigm in this population has really undergone seismic changes in the last several decades. I really just want to emphasize this is no longer a diagnosis of exclusion. We're using our neurologic skill set to appreciate on examination robust signs that allow us to make a diagnosis of F and D with high specificity. I'm going to show you some clues of this in several subsequent videos, but you should know that um, the international community has really rewritten the playbook for this. We're not talking about medically unexplained symptoms. We're talking about symptoms we see in clinic every day. And our neurologic skill set allows us to show that there are features that are inconsistent with structural lesions. In fact, with certain maneuvers, we can show that normal movement is possible even when the patient volitionally feels it's not possible. And we'll explore this more. So our task today, I wanna to give you all a sense of some of the work from my research lab. I wanna emphasize a work in progress because um, we're gonna use this 
uh, framework of functional neurologic symptoms, neurobiologically relevant constructs, and how those constructs map onto brain circuits. Um, we think that um, our results show quite a bit of promise in advance in moving this conversation forward. And you'll also see some of the links are still a bit speculative, but that means we have a lot of work still to do. For this audience, I wanna share our um, prior work also in resilience and attachment to really show how some of these constructs relate to a great many physical and mental health variables that I think are of interest for brain health as well. And then we have an article in press in the JNNP that'll be out later this month using machine learning algorithms to classify functional logical disorder. And I wanna share that with all of you here too. So you heard I'm a behavioral neurologist and neuropsychiatrist and foundational to that is this notion of brain behavior relationships. But what do I mean by behavior? I mean the full spectrum of human behavior. So this is encompass of brain emotion processing relationships, brain cognition relationships, brain perception relationships, and so on. And we're gonna use this model of symptoms, constructs, and neuro circuits to deconstruct a little bit how we make sense of functional neurologic symptoms. Let's first start with functional tremor. And for this audience, I wanna bring this right to the forefront. Patients who are shaking and do not feel in control of their shaking. Let's take a look at this video. So here, six, there's a large seven, amplitude nine, postural seven, tremor. Two. Cognitive distraction is not influencing the tremor. But now a competing motor movement has that postural tremor go away almost entirely. With volitional movements in another body part, there's time-locked movements as well. So you can influence the rhythm and the rhythmicity of that tremor. Ballistic movements. You'll notice a brief pause in that postural tremor. These are the rule in signs for a functional tremor. Variability, distractibility, and entrainment. What's happening here neuroscientifically? Well, let's go back a bit. So there was a landmark article published in Science in 2009. Individuals undergoing cortical stimulation, they had a variety of CNS lesions, largely brain tumors. So um, this cortical stimulation is happening to um, identify sites that are resectable. And in this particular study, they were stimulating in the inferior parietal lobule and temporal parietal junction. You can see my cursor, the areas here. Now at low intensity stimulation, individuals would verbalize, I wanna move. And at higher stimulation, they would verbalize, I've moved, when in fact, no movement had occurred. How do we identify this from a nerve circuit level? Well, there's a range of um, convergent findings that suggest that as we begin to develop a motor action plan, there is an afferent copy from primary sensory motor areas that is sent to the temporal parietal junction and the inferior parietal lobe. You're about to move, and the expected sensory consequences of your movement are X and Y. The temporal parietal junction is then doing a calculation between the expected sensory conse consequences of one's movement and the actual sensory information that's received. When the expectation meets the sensory input, the uh, perception of self-agency action authorship is realized. The other piece here that um, is incorporated into this conversation is we predict before we experience. To bring this home one step further, I imagine almost everyone has had the experience of running down a flight of stairs. And if you are like me, at some points, your predictions go wrong. And you predict that the step is there when it's not, right? your body posture has adopted a certain um, position. And when you find that the step's not there, gosh, it's 
very jarring. And it allows actually for an element of prediction error learning. We'll come back to that. But we predict before we experience. Now, Mark Hallett, who is one of the preeminent neuroscientists and neurologists in our field, and a real compliment to, um, to Mark, who, by the way, I believe is giving grand rounds in December 2024. I don't remember the exact date, but he's coming to Mass General. Mark is one of the most cited um, uh, neuroscientists um, in the world currently. And uh, Mark deserves a lot of credit because as a electrophysiologist and movement disorder expert, in the last few decades of his career, he identified functional motor disorder as the one of the biggest and complex problems that he could tackle. And he's made major advances. And one of the advances he made was identifying that when you scan patients with a functional tremor, who in this particular case had a, a position that would promote the functional tremor, but a second position could be adopted. And in that second position, the patient could mimic the rhythm of the tremor, but feel in control of their movements. So now we could subtract position A, shaking and not feeling in control of your movements versus position B, shaking and having ownership of those movements. And what Valerie Vu and Mark Hallett and colleagues identified is that when you contrasted functional tremor versus volitional movements, there was hypoactivation of the right temporal parietal junction. And when you did functional connectivity analyses, there was aberrant connectivity between the temporal parietal junction and sensory motor areas, among other brain regions. This was the first paper to articulate that potentially these were some of the core nodes and features that related to an impairment in action authorship in patients with the functional trauma. So the symptom, shaking and not feeling in control of one's movements, the construct, impairments in self-agency perception, and the implicated circuit, the right temporal parietal junction, and its connectivity profile to sensory motor areas. Let's continue this for the deep dive here of a range of um, uh, semiological presentations to functional neurological disorder. And now I want you all to think about full body shaking events. Um, what can resemble an epileptic seizure. Sometimes there's full body shaking events and the patient's wide awake and able to talk. So that might be a, a really bad paroxysmal functional motor event, or sometimes it's so severe, there's an impairment in behavioral response. Here is one such video of a documented functional seizure being captured in the epilepsy monitoring unit. Good, good. Keep blowing. It's definitely going to come again. Initially, those response. bicycle movements may have you think about frontal lobe epilepsy. Peanut butter. But now the My pattern of shaking is asynchronous. Like that. Just relax. Stops and starts. The bicycle but movements have right restarted, but at a lower frequency and amplitude. Lift your left arm up in the air. Point to the ceiling. Apart from muscle artifact, this patient's EEG um, was normal before, during, and after the event. This allows us to make a diagnosis of documented functional seizures. And just for those of us thinking about the epidemiology of this, one in three patients with medically refractory epilepsy is not responding to anti-seizure medications because they don't have epileptic seizures. They have functional seizures. The wrong treatment is being offered for a given patient. Okay, so here, um, I want to give a shout out to Bai Dez, who's now an assistant professor of radiology at the Massachusetts General, um, affiliated with the Martino Center and the Gordon Center. And Ibai and colleagues are experts in graph theory-based resting state functional connectivity analyses. And we were able to collaborate on a study that asked, how might the primary motor circuits 
and bottom up amygdala based circuits involved in salience and arousal and threat processing? How might there be aberrant communication across these two really important nodes, likely in the pathophysiology? And this allowed us um, this kind of question we use stepwise functional connectivity, which approximates information flow across brain networks in the brain. Happy to answer questions offline about how this works computationally. But ultimately what we're doing is identifying proximal connectivity, which refers to the first link step, and then subsequent downstream connectivity, which refers to the second link step and onward. And what we know, by the way, in healthy subjects is when you look at link step functional connectivity from primary sensory, primary auditory, and primary visual cortices, there's convergent information flow to multimodal integration brain areas. These multimodal integration brain areas are highlighted in green. We're talking about the temporal parietal junction the anterior insula, the dorsal anterior symptoms, regions that have been implicated over and over again in the pathophysiology of FND by other groups. So a bit more of the background of why we were keenly interested in studying information flow in this targeted way. So we recruited 30 patients with FND versus a matched healthy control group. And when we looked at information flow from the M1 area, primary motor areas, and compared information flow in FND versus healthy controls, what we observed is increased information flow in the patient group to the bilateral posterior insula, among other brain areas. Bottom up, when we began from the sensory portion of the amygdala, the lateral basal amygdala, and again, look at information flow across brain networks. Here we observed increased information flow to the anterior insula, left greater than right in patients versus healthy controls. What might be happening? So the insula is increasingly recognized as a core brain area in interoception and emotional and bodily awareness. The posterior insula is critical for uh, one's own calculation of the physiological state of the body, interoceptive processing. There are models to suggest that um, our physiological state of the body then receives affective and emotional and, and motivational weighting at the level of the mid insula where convergent information from other brain areas synapse there. And there's this higher order calculation that may be occurring anteriorly related to emotional and self-awareness. These are distributed networks. And in fact, if we take this too far, it's clearly uh, an oversimplification. But we can think about the insula, posterior, mid, and anterior, as really being important for body processing and, the, and the, um, the ways in which we interpret and react to the perceived physiological state of our body. This brings us to a potentially interesting speculation, which is if we think about the insula as being an important node in the pathophysiology of F and D and brain, mind, body conditions, are we seeing here an impairment in allostatic load recognition. Now I need to move my cursor for a moment so I can read the statement clearly for you all. But let's define allostasis. This is from our brain paper in um, uh, 2022 um, in collaboration with Lisa Feldman Barrett and colleagues. Allostasis, the active processing of forecasting the energetic needs of the body by modeling the body in the world and trying to meet those needs before they manifest, really critical. In fact, people argue that fundamentally what the brain is um, set up to do over and over again is to operationalize our needs, forecast those needs, 
and adaptively go about meeting those needs. We do a lot of this non-consciously. And part of the constructs that are important here are interception, among others. Let me make sure my slides can advance. So with this, and let's see if I didn't cut out one slide. Apologies if I did. Yeah, I cut out one slide. Um, so let's continue. I've made the argument that at least with this data, there seems to be a traffic jam as we think about how motor circuits and um, amygdala-based circuits are interacting one, with one another, there is accelerated information flow at the level of the insulin, important considerations both anterior and posterior. We observe something else as well, which is when you um, look at information flow from the sensory portion of the amygdala, the lateral basal amygdala, we also appreciated increased link step connectivity to subcortical brainstem structures, including the periaqueductal brain. And you can see that nicely here with my cursor. Now, the periaqueductal gray, there are direct amygdala PAG connections. And a range of physiology studies have shown that the PAG um, is involved in tonic immobility, fight or flight freezing responses. And patients with functional seizures, among other FND populations, one of the themes that occurs clinically is they might appear to the examiner as living in a bit of a hyper-aroused state. They're flush in the face. They're speaking with an anxious affect. When you ask them how they're feeling, they in fact report they're feeling just they're not, in fact, anxious or on high alert. This begins us to ask questions, well, how are they processing that potential increased adrenergic tone? And physiological studies, by the way, actually show that there's a mismatch, that while patients with functional seizures report a lack of hyperarousal states, physiologically, they're manifesting like a high degree of anxiety or um, a high degree of threat response. What we might see, for example, in post-traumatic stress disorder. So the symptom, these paroxysmal full body shaking events, the speculative construct in these individuals with tonic, chronic, hyperarousal, in some ways under-recognized, under-responded to, is this, is this leading to a bit of a limbic fast track? between the amygdala and the periaqueductal gray. Circuits that, while available maybe to all of us, are generally not used by the vast majority. And we want to continue to follow up on this work to interrogate the potential role of the amygdala and PAG to these whole body shaking events, as well as, frankly, these events of prolonged immobility. People will, will go, um, 30, 40, 50 minutes, several hours, unable to move, unable to speak, obviously hemodynamically stable throughout. What's happening there? And are some of these non-conscious defensive behaviors being activated in this population? The other piece that um, we're thinking about, and this is where I wanna just give a shout out to some of our occupational therapists. Uh, many of you will recognize Jessica Ranford and Julie McLean. We've been working together for almost a decade now. Um, and initially, we referred um, patients to occupational therapy given a diagnosis of FND and given some of the consensus recommendations. But it turned out that our occupational therapists had a playbook, a playbook that I didn't know about until we started collaborating more substantively. There is a long literature in occupational therapy about assessing and managing sensory processing difficulties. And in patients with FND, what we hear about over and over again clinically is bright lights, loud noises, body pain, migraines seem to trigger or intensify their functional neurologic symptoms. We've now replicated these findings in terms of sensory processing difficulties in two separate independent cohorts. And in this neurology clinical practice article published earlier this year, 
We've also shown that a number of patients appear to benefit from an occupational therapy-based sensory modulation intervention. This is one that's developed by Julie and, and Jessica, and we're looking to study this prospectively in the future. We also think that this occupational therapy playbook um, has likely utility for a range of conditions beyond uh, F and D, most notably conditions like chronic life. So um, bringing us back a little bit and even bringing me back to my early days at Columbia, where I um, spent several years with Eric Kandel and we were recording depth electrodes in um, subunits of the amygdala and, and other brain, brain areas. Um, back then we thought a lot about the importance of thalamo amygdala based um, connectivity, particularly around themes related to fear conditions. And this has led me to really want to push our lab to think about thalamo amygdala PAG interactions for the themes we've just talked about here. So F and D being triggered or amplified by sensory experiences. Are we seeing a bit of a, uh, a thalamo amygdala PAG fast track, particularly where sensory information, low granularity, but rapidly assessed um, and processed in threat centers, one that can then allow for some of these phenomena that we see clinically to emerge. This is a blending of prior findings and hypotheses that we're looking to test in the future. Another theme, maybe a theme that might be the most clinically appreciable um, for those who don't work day to day with this population is that a subset of patients with F and D will report that um, mood states, negative arousal states, will trigger or intensify their F and D symptoms. What's happening here? And this is really um, uh, a concept or a, a set of concepts that require a bit of context. So we now know through the systematic review published in Lancet Psychiatry in, I believe, 2018 by colleagues in the UK that the rates of childhood maltreatment are about three to fourfold higher in patients with F and D than in healthy control populations. We also know, by the way, not everybody with F and D has a history of childhood maltreatment or major adverse life experiences. Okay? This is an important misconception and one that I just like to state up front. Um, however, we can then think about the notion of, might there be a trauma subtype to functional neurological disorder? And this literature is a literature that has really informed some of the questions we've asked over the past decade, where about five to seven independent research groups have shown that individuals with F and D who have a history of childhood maltreatment, the magnitude of adverse life experiences is positively correlated with symptom severity, cross-sectional. A greater burden of symptoms for a higher magnitude of childhood maltreatment. We also know that there are other clinically relevant uh, modifications to the presentation, such as an earlier age of onset, potentially also a greater propensity towards being treatment refractory to evidence-based treatments. This is the foundation for asking, is there a trauma subtype to F&D? We'll talk about it. But for this audience, I just want to point out that um, People have been arguing for a trauma subtype of affective disorders, of alcohol and substance use disorders. And just in the past several years, there are papers now in migraine, in Tourette's, in Parkinson's disease, all arguing for a trauma subtype in those populations as well. Be happy to share with you the references for those articles. But the notion of a trauma subtype presenting more severe 
potentially with an earlier age of onset and potentially refractory to evidence-based treatments, cuts across neurologic conditions and psychiatric conditions. I think this is really, really interesting. So what have we done at this intersection in f and I'm bringing us all back to the notion that um, there's hyperconnectivity between the amygdala and motor control areas, as well as frankly, hyperconnectivity between other brain areas that are, that are important in salience and motor control. But here in this molecular psychiatry paper published in 2021, uh, we were among the first to recruit a psychiatric control group. Patients with depression, anxiety, and or PTSD recruited from the community who frankly by maybe naturalistic epidemiology were matched to our F and D group in terms of the magnitude of childhood maltreatment. So there were no differences in physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and so on between our psychiatric controls and our F and D control. But what we observed in this context was that in patients with F and D, with brain, mind, body symptoms, aberrant tremor, um, functional weakness, functional speech, functional seizures, overt motor symptoms, there was a dose dependent relationship between the magnitude of childhood abuse, physical abuse in particular, and how closely coupled the amygdala was to the precentral gyrus. We found the same relationship between the connectivity strength of the, of the insula to the precentral gyrus as well. Now, when you look at those curves and those scatter plots, in blue are our psychiatric controls. And this heightened connectivity between the amygdala and insula and motor control regions was not appreciated in our psychiatry. Providing some specificity to how risk factors and mechanisms neurocircuit wise can converge. So using this model, F and D symptoms uh, amplified or triggered by hyperarousal and negative mood states. The construct heightened limbic influence over motor behavior and the implicated circuit hyperconnectivity between motor control areas and the salience network, multiple nodes of the salience network. This here, if you're less familiar with thinking about the salience network, um, in orange and red are the core nodes of the salience network. I'll highlight with my cursor, the bilateral insula, the bilateral dorsal anterior cingulate, portions of the amygdala, and portions of the paraqueductal gray, right? So bringing home that this resting state network also appears to be um, very much implicated across several of our studies in the pathophysiology of FND. And the salience network is critically important for perceiving and responding to the physiological demands of the body. Okay, I'm watching time here. And I know this is a bit of kind of um, a rapid fire to hopefully get you think, thinking about um, both the advances and even some of the gaps that we need to chase after. But now I wanna just take a deliberate pause and ask us all to just think for a moment, what are emotions? We experience them, happiness, sadness, grief. What are they? What are emotions physiologically? When I experience happiness, is it the same kind of happiness that someone else listening in might experience? When I experience happiness, is it the same neurocircuit profile that occurs in myself that might be occurring in somebody else? And are emotions special? or can they be linked to the way we think about other constructs and concepts in the book? 
So during the pandemic, um, uh, my lab together with uh, two very talented postdocs in the lab had a really nice opportunity to collaborate robustly with Lisa Feldman Barrett. Lisa Feldman Barrett is predominantly at Northeastern, but has appointments at Mass General. She's written this really influential book, How Emotions Are Made. And I was familiar with Lisa's work for quite some time. And I recognized over and over again, the broad degree of applicability to brain, mind, body problems, including F and D. So we were very keen to think with Lisa. And one of the themes in F and D is patients will have these warning signs prior to F and D events, heart racing, shortness of breath, nausea, clouded thinking, feeling shaky on the inside. If you pull out your list of panic attack type symptoms, they check them off over and over again. What don't they check off? The actual emotion component, panic. And this has been um, framed as panic attacks without panic, a phenomenon that we see in F and D. What's happening here? Well, this brings us back to this notion that we predict before we experience. And in the basic building blocks of predictive processing, there's this notion of concepts. Okay, Concepts are acquired and refined through life experiences. Right? They're critically important for us to survive and adapt in an ever-changing environment. Concepts are issued as predictions and then sensory in information comes in and allows us to, with a match, have a perception. At times our predictions are incorrect. There's a mismatch. And this creates an opportunity for prediction error learning. Also concepts can have a granularity to them. You can think about the concept of an apple but if you're an apple connoisseur, you know that there are um, there's a great range of differences in apples from Red Delicious to Granny Smith and anything in between. Well, let's think about emotions. Might emotions be acquired and refined concepts over the course of our lifespan? Might there be important critical periods for this um, acquisition early in life? And might there be differences in the granularity of our emotion concepts? There can be low level granularity, feeling stressed out, or there can be a high level of granularity, such as a nuanced description. Again, concepts um, can be issued as predictions. There's a sensory experience coming in. There can be a match, or there can be prediction error learning. Let's take a concrete example to bring this home. We are giving a really important talk to a wonderful audience, right? Let's say it's right now. And let's say that uh, my thinking is a touch cloud. My heart is racing, a bit shaky on the inside. I'm tremulous as well. Now, how do I make sense? How do we make sense? We just may say, gosh, I'm having a, height, a heightened adrenergic state because I'm um, very pleased to be visiting with all of you. I'm not saying I'm medically unwell. I'm not saying that there's a medical emergency. And frankly, I'm not surprised that there's a bit of shakiness or a bit of dyssynchrony in my thought pattern. This happens, right? But what if my voice went and I was shaky and I was imbalanced, and I was clouded in my thinking, and I could not link it to a particular context. And what if I predicted in a non-emotion prediction kind of way, a health or illness related concept, shaking, unwell, the same sensory experience is matched to an entirely different concept. And without prediction error learning, 
that experience for the given patient is true. So this notion of emotions, emotions, motion concepts are not universal is uh, the theory of constructed emotions. We share many similarities because socioculturally we um, overlap tremendously. But ultimately, if we use our emotion concepts, we may be incorrect in predicting the emotional state of another. And we speculated in this brain article that either there are differences in the granularity of emotion concepts in patients with brain mind body symptoms, or the instances in which emotion or non emotion concepts are being used as predictions vary in patients with FD. Maybe the emotion concepts are there, they're just not being used adaptively in certain situations. Or maybe the emotion concepts aren't there at all. Um, so panic attack without panic. The speculative construct here, are we seeing a phenomenon that is essentially aberrant emotion construct, aberrant emotion construction in real time? And the theoretical basis in the neuroscience Neuroscience for Predictive Process argues for really important roles for the default mode network in um, concept generation and predictions and in the salience network in prediction error learning. Two networks that are really, really important in the pathophysiology of f &D. And these themes of uh, predictive processing are themes that we continue to um, want to uh, dive deeper in in our next wave of research. I'm watching for the time. I'm gonna transition succinctly, but hopefully in a way that um, has you all um, uh, uh, captivated and continuing to think about these themes. Look, we've um, we started from scratch. So 10 years ago, there was no clinical or research program in F&D. Um, I've shown you some of the work in our first cohort. I'm gonna end by showing you some of the neuroimaging work in our latest cohort. And we've uh, maintained productivity by doing a range of retrospective studies at our clinical program, which is innovative. And then we've also maintained productivity by asking questions around certain constructs that appear underdeveloped or understudied in this patient population. And two constructs that, um, we've been interested in are the constructs of perceived resilience and perceived adult attachment styles. I have the definition of resilience there on the screen. I just wanna show you that the Connor Davidson um, resilience scale, a widely used scale for measuring patient perceived resilience. Um, how does it behave in our cohort, in functional neurological disorder, and frankly, in a great range of other populations? What I think is so nice to see about these scatter plots is in univariate analyses, all the directions are what you'd expect, right? So higher perceived resilience, lower uh, state trait anxiety, lower depression, lower PTSD scores lower neuroticism, lower, with, lower difficulty putting emotions into words, lexithymia, higher resilience, perceived, okay? Greater conscientiousness, greater openness, an overall um, uh, better perception of one's mental health, et cetera. All the directions, exactly what you'd expect which then lends the question, what is this notion of perceived resilience? And is this a therapeutic target in itself? The other piece here, we've looked at attachment. and The notion of, of attachment uh, styles could take up a whole talk. But I just wanna succinctly highlight here that we can think about attachment as secure or insecure, and then there are variants of insecure attachment. Right? We've looked at this with the relationship scales question. 
we find again that attachment is a really rich construct to think about the heterogeneous and multiplicity of, of variables that likely go into the biopsychosocial complexity of this population and many others. So no surprise, perceived resilience and perceived secure attachment, highly positively correlated. Secure attachment, better reported mental health, more extrovert, uh, more extrovert in one's interpersonal style. Lower secure attachment, more neuroticism, more difficulty putting emotions into words, higher state trait anxiety, and greater PTSD severity. Constructs around resilience and attachment, I think are themes that as we think about brain health um, and brain medicine, we really want to do deeper dives in. The last bit, I'll be very succinct here. So um, from 2018 to 2023, we've been collecting data. We've been collecting data on a new cohort of FND patients. We've been growing our psychiatric control group. We've been collecting healthy control subjects. And we now have a paper in press on 183 prospectively collected participants. And if you've spent a bit of time with me, you know that I love to knock down the walls of neurology versus psychiatry and everything in between. So we started in, by asking the question, can we use structural MRI features to classify a functional neurological disorder? Because structure function are highly coupled in the brain, period. Might be an issue of scale, right? There's no... Um, uh, uh, macroscopic structural, but if these functional patterns are occurring over and over again, there must be an underlying structural pathophysiology for this. So the framing is, um, you know, FND is a functional network problem, but might in fact it be both a structural and functional problem. We've articulated this in several ways. Um, uh, in this paper, we used both supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms, but the findings were related to supervised uh, machine learning approaches. Uh, in this case, support um, vector machine classification. We're looking for a multivariate boundary between one patient group uh, and our controls, and we're doing cross-validation as well. And let me just jump to the punchline here which is that while there were a range of interesting findings, um, the most robust was that in 46 patients with functional motor symptoms versus an age and sex matched um, comparison group of healthy controls, also 46, we were able to identify a multivariate boundary that had a specificity of 0.83 in distinguishing F and D versus our healthy control groups. We also, by the way, with less impressive statistics with the overall group, 61 F and D versus 61 psychiatric controls versus 61 healthy controls, we were able to classify F and D and distinguish F and D from both psychiatric controls and healthy controls. But the metrics here for the motor group were the most robust against healthy controls. And we, can all, we also found that some of the features really important for classification were the same across a range of analyses, including portions of the default mode network, uh, in this case, the isthmus cingulate, among other areas, which potentially will lead us down this track of thinking more deeply about dissociation and impairments in um, one's processing of um, uh, their self-identity and their, their concepts of, of body recognition, the fragmentation of how one feels in their body, which relates to dissociation, and a fragmentation of how one processes the outside world, another form of dissociation. So it takes a big team, and this is uh, the group here that I get a chance to work with over and over again. Uh, we all learn from each other. Uh, shout out to Christy Westland, our um, PhD neuroscientist, who was the first author in that last paper. 
And thank you all for allowing me to visit with this distinguished group. Let me stop sharing my slides. Well, David, that was a, a tour de force. And um, we only have two minutes. So I want to respect everyone's time. Please put your questions in the chat if you have questions. Um, and I don't see any yet. So I'm just going to lead off. Uh, if you could help reorient this neurologist who, who started training before uh, the explosion of your work and John Stone's work before that, um, we were often taught that uh, psychiatric comorbidities played a big role in FND. And recently when I've looked this up, it, it looks like there's great disparity in terms of the number, the estimates. Uh, but I, I suspect, I mean, the, certainly the message you're giving is it's not clear what comes first, uh, but maybe you could just help from a practical standpoint, address those of us who see individuals with FND, how we should just be thinking about the presence, absence of psychiatric comorbidities and whether we really ought to not focus on them and first focus on the FND. Great question, Jonathan. Um, let me answer it this way, which is something that didn't come up in my talk. There are a range of um, subtypes, clinically and I think biologically in FND. And um, on a clinical side, one of the subtypes that we see in the outpatient clinic over and over again are patients who um, are high achieving, high functioning in their day-to-day -day life, who've never seen a psychiatrist or mental health professional. In fact, their playbook is that they're used to going 120%. That's their normal. And, and, and everything that comes with that, how they normalize their thought patterns, how they normalize the physiological state of their body. They also tend to be very problem focused. Then they have a bump in the road. They develop brain, mind, body symptoms, and they use the same playbook to try to get out of that situation. Mm. And in fact, that subtype maybe needs different kinds of treatment, including they need to hear from people like myself and everyone here that um, their subtype of FMD is different than that subtype where you can almost not distinguish between their flashbacks and PTSD symptoms and FND symptoms. So I think we need to think about subtypes, um, including that one subtype is this high achieving subtype where there it hasn't been time for deep processing of their psychological self. Um, they've quite not made time for you know um, how they address symptoms of depression and anxiety. Our life is very hectic in 2024. And we can think about how notions of brain, mind, body overload might be very relevant for that person, but different than the person who's got too numerous to count psychiatric hospitalizations and borderline traits, et cetera. I see a question from Greg. Yes. Wonderful talk, David. Um, I've heard you talk many times and um, I always come away with learning something very important. So thank you. But, and you don't have time to answer this question, but I, I've never really asked it of you. You know, it seems to me like you you are in, in your person retracing Freud's uh, um, uh, adventure uh, into the brain. So as you as you were speaking today, I was thinking what what uh, Freud would would be thinking uh, if he was in the audience. Um, so uh, someday we have to have a cup of coffee, and you have to give me your impressions. Thanks, David. Thank you, Greg. And and this oh, notion of Price with the last question. <laughs> if that's okay, I want to make sure she has a chance. Do we still have time for a last question? Yes, go for it. It's yours. Okay, amazing. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the amazing talk. I was just wondering, have you thought about any um, like interventions in terms of psychedelic assisted therapy or meditation if you want to change the plasticity of the insula or the amygdala, like thal thalamic uh, amygdala pathways? Great question. Um, so uh, people are looking into this. And one of the notions of psychedelics is that... Um, if we think about F and D as part of the issue is that there's these priors or these concepts that have um, 
a um, high amount of weighting in terms of their preferential use, and this is problematic in one's predictive processing, then the thought there is that with psychedelics, this might be an intervention to alleviate or modify or influence the weight of those priors, right? So that's the theoretical foundation for some of this. And that's being looked at. Colleagues and friends at King's College have a psychedelic study right now ongoing in F&D. And I think this is, this is ripe. But this notion of predictive processing and how to capture that is, I think, quite interesting. Yeah, thank well, you so much. Uh, David, uh, really a, a terrific talk. You've done so much to open up this world uh, to all of those of us who've tried to figure out ways to rigorously integrate the mind and the brain as it should be. And uh, we're all in your debt and look forward to following your work. So thanks very much. Have a great week, everyone. Jonathan, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, David.